I'm Scott. I'm Rim. We are the hosts of Geek Nice. It is a podcast. If you like hearing us talk for some reason instead of listening to good music, you can <laughs> on your whatever device you have listen to us talk. It's totally free. Just like a bajillion MP3s. You go to our website. There they are. Okay, something going on back there. <laughs> Today we are going to talk about the real harm of games. Are games harmful, right? Oh, they're so harmful, everyone just came to this convention to hurt themselves. Maybe. <laughs> just, it's just past, just a big old spike pit. Everyone jumped on it. <laughs> All right, real harm of games. So we're going to talk about some history. All right, so going back even further than Satomichi's time, right, many games have been viewed as, you know, the... You know, the uh, like vice, right? They're, they're hurting people, you know? Dice and gambling, that's only for, for Yakuza and other, you know, well, think about pop folks. Think about movies. You'll see, like, the classic trope of, like, the shady people in the pool hall, like, playing pool, and someone pulls out a knife, or the shady people rolling dice in the back of the ship right. instead of doing what they're supposed to do in the British Navy. Yeah, there's an old musical about River City, <laughs> but not, not this River City. <laughs> this River City... <laughs> Right? And a major plot point of this movie is that in order to swindle the town right, into, into giving him a lot of money, right, Professor Hill, he convinces them that this, you know, this pool table, this billiards hall that's being set up in the town that is becoming more popular is going to turn all the young boys into the town into, into lazy do-nothings who just sit around and play pool all day. Right? Another example of society considering games to be a source of ill, right, not a source of good. Now, it's been very tied to classism and, like, culture at different times, so some games were seen as elevated, they were the games of the educated classes, the aristocracy, other games were seen as played by undesirables, they were associated with the kinds of people you don't want in your town, meaning institutional racism, all that sort of stuff. So this is a long history here that we're not super experts on, but you've all seen it in pop culture, you know right. these In Zatoichi's time, you know, playing dice was not okay, or at least viewed as not okay, but playing Go was like, oh, we're playing Go. Yeah. Professor like Harold Hill's time, well, he, he was a real person, playing chess would be like, oh, playing chess. But playing pool, no good, right? So there's this history of viewing certain games or some games as being harmful, whether they were or not, right? Especially here, anyone know who this is? Who's in the picture? That's Mayor LaGuardia, right? They say, the rumor is, is that he was mad at pinball because he was short and insecure about his, his stature, <laughs> and so he couldn't play the pinball games, right? But the, he, the, the excuse that they used for instituting a ban on pinball in New York City up until the early 70s was that pinball was... 1970s! A, yeah, 1970s, was that it was a scam by the mafia, right? We're setting up pinball machines to trick kids out of their money, Right? It was like, ah, oh, they're setting up these machines to, to take money from the kids and give it to the, to the mob bosses. Casanostra really needs those dimes. They added up those dimes. <laughs> dime was a lot in 1960, 50, whatever, right? You know, dime was big money then. You could buy, like, a whole ice cream from it. But this even, so we used to live in upstate New York in a town called Beacon, and Beacon made the news because someone made a retro arcade that had old, classic arcade games and pinball machines, and it was really got, awesome. It was a crazy game. place. These are like mechanical machines. This guy was like one of those crazy old collector dudes. He collected all these awesome old games, kept them in like perfect condition, let you have a birthday party there, right? It was an awesome place, but because there was still some old kind of pinball noise ordinance... There was a law in Beacon that's over 100 years old that banned pinball and amusements of its sort in the town, so a nosy, a nosy neighbor used that law to get this place Plain shut down. Me, right? But yeah, that's, this is a real thing that happened. This is like some joke image. Right? But yeah, pinball was viewed as evil. Now pinball is like really wholesome, right? It's like a family, <laughs> family kind of activity, right? Okay, so of course, also, right, D&D &D, uh, and many other things were viewed as, you know, demonic and satanic. It right? is very easy for all of you to laugh at this because many of you are somewhat young, but I grew up in the 80s and this was still a thing in the 80s. I literally lost a friend in middle school because his mom thought that Dungeons and Dragons would turn that kid into a Satanist and would never let me speak to him again. These aren't fake newspapers. These are real articles from real newspapers. Look, the Daily Trojan, wherever that is. I guess <laughs> where, where the Trojan is like college basketball team, so I, I mean, imagine that. Dungeons and Dragons, just harmless fun? Or sorcery. Right. If it was legit sorcery, I'd be playing a lot more D&D. &D. Right. <laughs> and of course, in the bottom right is a frame from a chick trap. 
track. Uh, if you don't know what chick tracks are, you can Google that. I don't got time for that. You right consider now. yourself lucky. Yeah. Huh? Or or not? You know, they're they're kind of funny now. But the fact that even in the eighties and nineties, this it was and to a degree is still a thing. Magic the Gathering was banned in my high school because some of the teachers thought that it was an anti-Christian influence. Right. You know, it's like you know this kind of belief has been around for a super long time, right? Rock and roll was viewed as like the devil, right? You can't show Elvis swinging his hips around because that's the devil, right? <laughs> and it, it's not a gone away, right? It hasn't gone away. Harry Potter and Pokemon have both, right? I can find news. I found newspaper articles for both of these where it's like, yeah, people really believe that these things are going to turn your kids into Satan worshippers, and they're super harmful and bad. And the thing is, they were actually totally right. Satan's kind of awesome. <laughs> Satan is awesome, <laughs> right? Uh, sadly, they were wrong about the sorcery part, because if I had sorcery, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but I totally, or, think, I totally think Satan is cool. Or I would be giving a very different panel right now. <laughs> totally different panel. Uh, yeah, this is, guys, this is how you summon a whole bunch of friends to play D&D with, <laughs> away from their jobs. But at a high level, to get more to our serious talk, what does this mean? We see, like, society in America deciding that a certain thing, some games or some media that kids are playing, is going to corrupt them in some way, and the corruption they saw was that it will make them Satan worshippers. And they also assumed that being a Satan worshipper would be harmful. They were wrong most of those steps, but you can see how that cultural perception would lead to this feeling that games will corrupt my children, and it uses the fears of the people of the time. Right, so they were right about this one, that it will turn you into liking Satan, but they were wrong, and that it won't really harm you. I don't think I'm harmed by thinking Satan is awesome. Check out that statue, that is awesome. <laughs> I'll put that in my house. I have room for it. Anyway. All right, so things really got hot. This is, this is in my memory, right? In the early 90s, when Mortal Kombat came out, right? This was like the big deal. It was on every local news station, right? Mortal Kombat, it was like, this was pretty much, you know, there were video games before this that were definitely unacceptable for children, like Custer's Revenge or something. But yeah. those were not games that people here probably don't even know the game. Don't look it up. Uh, but, you know, these games are ultra rare, they weren't sold anywhere, they didn't, right? Mortal Kombat was like in every shopping mall, and you go to the burger joint, there's a Mortal Kombat. You go to the Super Nintendo, there's a Mortal Kombat, right? It was just all over the TV, there were commercials while you're watching cartoons, right? Mortal Kombat was the, basically the first ultra-violent game that got the attention of the population, and we found a local news clip to watch, to prove to you in case you're younger than us. Oh, the national news. How about that? Many children as you parents know put them on their Christmas list. As ABC Phil Greenwood reports, there is a growing concern on Capitol Hill. The parents who buy some of those games may not realize just how much violence they're getting. <gasps> One of the most Get over here. games is called Mortal Kombat. <laughs> the objective is to finish off your opponent violently. <laughs> I remember when that kid in my class ripped out the other kid's heart and ate it. <laughs> oh, shit, son. Including the national PTA, say such video games contribute to violence in real life. And television's Captain Kangaroo says parents are not... He really hated video games, if you didn't know this. ...that these are not harmless boys. That uh, they can indeed uh, cause great emotional and uh, other damage to a child. Yeah, when I lost. We did do that. What happened to you, Asa? I don't like this game. Bodies? Wait, what? My spine seems to still be in my body. If you had a Sega. It's there. I'm not going to try to hide my daughter from that. Even so, That's the best dad. The dad's like, what are you talking about? Voluntary system to rate video games for use by a general audience, those over 13 and over 17. But there are lots of places where youngsters can play video games. Look at those youngsters. For adult supervision. <laughs> so next week, the U.S. Senate will conduct hearings on ways to supervise the video industry. Go back and watch those hearings if you want to have a fun time. They are really depressing. So this was like the first really like wide on the TV. You know, the D&D thing was in the local newspaper. It wasn't really on the national news. Mortal Kombat. This is on the national news. Scaring people that video games or any kind of game will harm your children. Watch out. Now when we saw right. all this new stuff, my mom was like, oh, we gotta get that game. All right. So eventually this led to this guy named Jack Thompson. And then much later, we had the response from Jade McGonagall. Right. So we're going to talk about these two people 
So you see, even though these people have no direct relation to each other, I've never seen them talk about each other even or mention each other or recognize each other's existence, but it's like these are basically the exact opposite people on this issue, right? Jack Thompson, Possibly actually, on this earth. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Thompson, he came around not really in the Mortal Kombat days, though he's definitely old enough to have seen those days. He mostly became active more in the Grand Theft Auto times, which was really only like five, six years after that. It really wasn't that much time. Uh, and Gene McGonagall, basically ten years after that, came around, right? So let's talk about Jack Thompson. Everyone knows who Jack Thompson is? No? Maybe? Ooh, only I, a few people? I am not a lawyer. And neither is he anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack Thompson in the early 2000s in the video game community, right, was a huge deal. This guy, he was suing video game companies. He was all over the news, all over the CNN, all over pretty much everything, yelling and screaming about how, you know, video games, Grand Theft Auto was going to turn kids into psycho massacre nut jobs who were going to shoot everyone up. Right, we need to ban these things. He thought it, he legitimately believed, and probably still does, that it was like a serious crisis. Right, that like that playing video games would turn you into a mass murderer the same way that smoking will give you cancer. He really believed that. Right, that's who he was, and he was so crazy. It, it, it wasn't just that he believed that; it's that just the way he behaved. He was like some sort of like ambulance chasing lawyer, right? And that he would like put on all kinds of lawsuits. Right, he even. The people who run this convention talk to him, right? Because as you imagine, the topic of many Penny Arcade comics in those days was this guy who was like the biggest story in the video game news community, in the video game media, right? So they also made comics saying like, yeah, video games are not going to turn you into killer, right? We make all these funny comics. We don't kill anyone. There's this whole building full of people. No one's died this weekend, I hope. Right? <laughs> the night is playing, young. We, most of us in this building have seen or played Mortal Kombat and we haven't ripped anyone's spine out of their head. Like, Jack Thompson was so aggressive going after video games that we even had a rule on our podcast where he came up with the news so often. Our podcast started in 2005, that's why it yep. was old enough to. We could not talk about him again unless he did something even crazier than the last thing he did, and we still talked about him a lot. Yeah, I guess if you listen to early Geek Nights, we always say, like, Jack Thompson. Jack we always, Thompson. We always said his name in a funny way. Guess who's in the news again? It's Jack Thompson. He's coming for your Mortal Kombat. All right, so this guy is the epitome of the <sighs> video games will harm you bad guy historically, but because he was so bad a lawyer, I guess he was disbarred. I guess you have to be a pretty bad lawyer to be disbarred. I think he's still in Florida doing something, but look, thankfully, we have not heard from him in a long time. But he was alarmist and wrong about basically everything he said about video games. No merit to any argument he made at any point. Right. So now, right, because Penny Arcade dealt with Jack Thompson, right, and they sort of thwarted him, I guess, somehow, uh, they actually had to deal with another guy who was a local radio show host, like, in the Seattle area, who espoused many of the same Jack Thompson ideas. And that battle with that guy directly led to the existence of Child's Play that you now see all over PAX. They were like, look, games don't turn us gamers into bad people. We are good people. We will prove it. Look at this charity we made. And I guess to date, they've raised 44 million something. I probably just added a whole bunch of this number at this PAX because I took the screenshot before I left the house. Before I bought a lot of cookies. Right. Child's Play exists because they wanted to prove people like Jack Thompson wrong. And arguably they did. Like... This is a net. This that is radio, a Jack Thompson never apologized for anything, but oh, the radio no. show guy did. He was like, oh, I'm sorry. But he no one can disagree. Childhood, child's Play does good work. It makes the world a better place, and it is a direct result of games. Right. I'm just trying to show you these things to show you that, like, the place that we are in now, this PAX East, has a strong connection to the story that we are telling you about, you know, going back to Satuichi's <laughs> time, right? <laughs> it's brought us here today. All right, so let's talk about Jane. Right, Jane McGonigal, she gave the keynote at this event in this building in the 20... 2011. The 2011. first PAX East that was in this building. Right, so the second PAX East, the first one in this building, she gave the keynote. Right, who is she? Well, this is exactly what she says she is. Right? Yep, in her own words, she's a PhD. <coughs> she believes game designers are on a humanitarian mission. She thinks games will make the world a better place, that they're a net positive for humanity as a whole. Right, so this is the exact opposite. It's not only that games aren't harmful. Jane McGonagall says games are actually beneficial, right? Because we all play games, we are not only not turning into bad people or hurting ourselves, we are making ourselves better by playing games. Playing games is like eating health food and doing exercise and all these other things, you know, doing charitable works, right? Do playing games makes things better for you and for everybody. Now, one of the arguments around this is that we're mammals, right? 
Uh, mammals intrinsically play with each other. Play is in many ways a form of learning to address consequences and face problems without dying as a result of making poor decisions along the way. I learned how to fight as a puppy by fighting other puppies. Now I can fight real dogs when I'm bigger. Right. Play is definitely not exclusive to humans. I just saw a Twitter video like this week of like some crows on a snowy windshield, like rolling down the windshield, having some fun, and going back to the top and rolling down again. This wasn't. This is obviously play. There's no other reason the crow would do that other than to have fun. And he was definitely hopping about in a happy kind of way. Okay. So James. Work. So what has Jane done? She wrote this book called Reality is Broken that she was promoting here when she did her keynote in 2011, right? The book is exactly what it says on the cover, why games make us better and how they can change the world. Uh, I have the book. I didn't read the whole book. It's kind of long. I'm really bad at reading nonfiction. I like me a wizard story because, you know, I like Satan. <laughs> I like a wizard story or a sci-fi story better. Uh, but, you know, I read most of it, right? And that's exactly what the book is about. You, see, you list all these different ways, like, oh, this study, this study, right? The games have helped these people, and such and such. But right? she also did something else, and this is very much more interesting to our talk right here. She made something called Super Better, which is a game that is designed to help you cope with mental issues, with physical issues, with injuries, and there is real evidence that it is therapeutic, mm -hmm. like a drug might be. Right, she herself had concussion problems and made this to help herself and then adapted it to help other people, right? And in fact, Playing super better for 30 days improves mood, reduces symptoms of anxiety and depression, increases belief in the ability to successfully achieve goals, results from randomized controlled study controlled by the University of Pennsylvania. This is a true thing. Super better is proven as much as any other medicine you buy the over the counter that's real and isn't fake. It's so proven an, to help you. As an aside, I highly recommend if any of you think something like, that, like this could help you, go get super better and it's try just an this app. game out. What do you got to lose? Might as well try it. Right? Worst case, you get bored with it and go back to Mortal Kombat. There is a better chance of this helping you get better than there is of Mortal Kombat doing anything bad to you, right? Okay, so I gotta say, I'm sort of afraid to do this panel a little bit because, you know, we're gonna talk about, you know, are there, are there ways in which games could harm you, right? Are, you know, we, we showed you that Jack Thompson was wrong and James was right, but are there other things about games? Are there harmful games out in the world? Right, and I don't want people to view me as Jack, Jack Thompson, because Thompson. <laughs> it seems that everyone who ever comes along, you know, like Principal Skinny here, and is like, uh, games are harmful in this other way. No, maybe they're harmful in this way. Gets you know reacted to in the same way that we reacted to Jack Thompson. Just Thompson was wrong, and thus should receive that reaction. But if someone does find a way in which games are harmful, and they're right, should they be Jack Thompson? Right? And we see this with like nerd culture in general where we as a community get very defensive when people attack our hobbies. Po possibly because our hobbies have been under attack because they were Satanists and all these other reasons for so long. A lot of people who are into nerdy things feel like, oh, this hobby is under assault by the outside world for reasons. They get real defensive. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard in that climate to have real introspection and real reflection on what our hobbies really do. There are things I like that suck or are bad for me, but I still like them and do them, and I hope I understand the harms right. I'm So, so standing on a stage at PAX and possibly saying that games could be harmful <laughs> could, be, <laughs> could be troublesome. Especially because, let's look at what we just said. Super Better is clinically shown to help people, to change people. That means games can change people in a clinical way. What the hell? Medicine, you're giving me shit. I didn't do that. Something just happened. Anyway, it's everyone else who's wrong. So medicine exists in the same world that poison does. If super better is like medicine, then it is possible there is a video game equivalent of poison. That is possible. entirely possible. We cannot discount that possibility. Right. So I was, you know, when I came up with this panel, I'm like, ooh, do I really want to give this panel? Well, I'm giving it, so whatever. All right. So which of these people is right? Jack Thompson was obviously wrong. Jane was right, but... You know, on the question of violence, right, making you violent, or games helping you. But on the larger question of can games be harmful or games are never harmful, well, we'll see about that. Because we're now going to go through a bunch of possible harms, right? <laughs> Starting with the question we already answered, right? Do violent games make players violent? Now, I grew up playing horrifically violent video games my entire life. Also watching horrifically violent movies. I saw Vampire Hunter D, the original, when I was like eight years old because my mom wanted me to. And I saw it with my little brother who was two and a half years younger than me. We turned out fine. I have not sliced any vampires in half. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the problem is, is 
you know, no one in this building that I know of has, has done any horrifically violent acts. Hopefully they would be banned from PAX forever. Has anyone raised your hand if you have? Let me just get my yeah, phone out. Right. The, the problem is, is the plural of anecdote is not data. Survivor right? bias is a thing. If cool kids close their eyes and run across the freeway, everyone who survives that can say, hey, I survived it. What's wrong with your kids? Like, yep. Survivor bias is a thing. I might just be immune to violence in video games. I might turn violent 40 years from now. I'm just a piece of anecdotal data. Mm -hmm. So I went and I did a slight amount of effort into putting this panel together and found some citations from some studies on the internet. And I'm not going to pretend to understand these studies or to have read them in full because that costs money and I'm not a doctor. <laughs> so I have provided links for you to read them yourself or to maybe find the opinion of a more intelligent person. But uh, the summary that I got from all these studies that I found was most likely not. The AP review, there was an AP review that does confirm a link between playing video games and aggression. It did not provide any sort of link between playing violent video games and committing violent crimes. It just, you know, it was more like, oh, you've played these violent games and now your attitude is more aggressive, right? You were, you were in a more aggressive mood after you play the game. I prefer the term assertive. Yes. <laughs> but... In the same vein, uh, violent video games found not to be associated with adolescent aggression, Oxford, right? Research is the University of York found no evidence to support the theory video games make players more violent, right? Does playing video games with violent content temporarily increase aggressive inclinations? A pre-registered experimental study, that is a meta-study that looked at a whole group of studies all about the same thing, and it, came, and it lent much more on the side of the, no, it doesn't, right? So again, most likely not, based on non-scientist reading actual scientific papers that you should read yourself, <laughs> violent video games will not turn you into I'll take a violent it. person, right? Okay, we answered one. We haven't found any harms yet. Let's see if we can find any harms in any other areas, right? Do games help train you to be violent? This is now a different this, question. Now, this game... Is any, if anyone's not familiar with this game, Police Quest was this like point-and-click adventure, kind of like Dragon Quest, but you're a cop doing real-life cop things. It's really technical and boring and realistic. I like these games. But SWAT was a weird version of this game. It was promoted by Daryl Gates. The, the, if you read the history of Daryl Gates, he's problematic, but he's part of the reason why police departments are the way they are today, for good or bad. And this game was a realistic sort of training simulator that was coached as just another police quest game that taught you real SWAT team tactics. Like, here is how to sweep a room. Here is how firing drills work. Here are the protocols and procedures for breaching things. It's almost like, like an old DOS game. It is just this old DOS game. It looks pretty good in the still shots because it's pre-rendered graphics. Oh yeah, like this, is like, this is like 40p if you actually play the video. Yeah, yeah, it's real bad. Uh, but yeah, so the question is, right, so even though... Uh, you know, I, video games didn't make me into a violent person. I'm just a violent person, <laughs> right? Can, are there video games that I could go get and use to train myself to be more effective to enact my violent plan? Will right? PUBG make me more dangerous? Right. I've decided to, 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 to shoot people because I'm bad, not because the video games didn't make me that way, but I don't know how to shoot people. Is there some video game I can go get and learn how to shoot people and then do a horrible thing? Because if that were the case, we shouldn't be distributing basically these like guides to hurt people. Right, to the general public, right? So is this a thing that is true? Yes and no. So no, if you go and like play Counter-Strike and then I give you a gun, you will be useless with that if that is the only <laughs> thing you know about guns. You will not know how to load the gun, you will not know how to shoot the gun. You will hurt yourself, you probably will shoot yourself. I just right. imagine someone trying to rob the bank with a desert eagle. <laughs> right. Even though video games might depict weapons and other violent things realistically, the vast majority of the games, even the very realistic ones that you get at home, like say Arma is a super realistic military game, will not actually teach you very much about how to use weapons, how to hurt people, or how to do anything like that. So, and the reason for that, I poked into these studies a little bit, is because, yes, Arma is a hyper-realistic game where you, like, twiddle all the different knobs on a rifle and then use it. But you're not gaining the muscle memory of actually doing those with a physical object, so it doesn't really teach you anything more than reading a book would teach you for these kinds of things. Right, so video game violence, the military and game developers can't both be right. Game developers were like, no, no, it's safe, but the military, meanwhile, is using video games... To train people. And to wait, train drone pilots. Why would to they train be, fighter pilots. Right. Why would they be using games to train people if it didn't work? 
And the reason is because when you make the game as a simulator that fully simulates the real world, then actually, yes, yes, it can train you. If you fly in a plane simulator, you will learn how to drop bombs on people, and then when you go in the real plane, it will be just like that, except for maybe the G-forces, but they even try to simulate that as well. Now, this wasn't a problem for a long time because at flights, no matter how good your DOS computer was, you couldn't get a flight simulator. Yeah, go play enough. Microsoft Flight Simulator for Windows 95 and tell me <laughs> if you can fry it. But flight, a real flight simulator that like you get actual flight hours towards your pilot's license going in real simulators that cost tens of millions of dollars. So fun fact, I have logged four hours in a legit Army Air Force F-16 flight simulator full cockpit. Four reasons. It's really hard to fly them, but I can almost take off an F-16. So theoretically, <laughs> if you put me in an F-16 fighter, there's a small chance I will get it into the air. <laughs> so, for now, this isn't really a great concern, but as you can see in the Expo Hall, it's full of VR. A lot of VR, right? So as the VR comes and becomes more of a thing and is something people have in their houses, maybe. I don't believe that's actually going to happen as soon as other people believe it will happen. VR's awesome. I don't know why you're so down on it. I just think it's way behind where people feel it is. Anyway. Super hot taught me how to be real dangerous. <laughs> but the point is, you could imagine a VR game that is like Arma. Right? And that instead of having those weird VR controllers, we have like a, a, you know, an M16 made of plastic or something, but functions exactly like a real M16, and that could theoretically train you to hurt people, and maybe we shouldn't make that. Or here's another easy example. At least example. not make it available to people in their homes. Here's a game we can make today. A lot of police departments use uh, shoot-don't-shoot simulators. Now, these don't work as well as they should. Hogan's for, Alley. For ra reasons mostly related to racism I don't want to get into, but... The simulators are like Hogan's Alley VR. They're like VR before VR existed, where they play videos and you'd have a fake gun and like a situation happens and you have to decide if you're gonna shoot or not shoot. And those are used to train people to use guns effectively in those kinds of situations. It would be trivial to make that game in VR. And it would make a person more effective in those very narrow situations at engaging in violence. So yeah, it is possible to theoretically make a harmful video game, but it is not a concern right now. All right, sports injuries. We always got to do this at a Geek Nights panel to remind all the nerds that sports are games. Sports are games. Yep. And there you can get hurt playing sports really, really badly. He was harmed by a game. That's true. Directly, the game hurt him. There's no argument. That is real. It's real. It's the game's fault. If the game did change the rules, if the game was played differently, he wouldn't be hurt. Now, Kobe lying on the ground is one thing. <laughs> Holding his ankle, probably. Right? But uh, there are very much more serious sports injuries, right? It's like you can play basketball and build your whole career without hurting yourself. It's not that dangerous, right? But if you play football, you will be harmed. Right? Yeah. Your brain will be bashed in if you play football. It will most likely... There, there's tons of research on this now. There is a you game. will probably get CTE or get some kind of brain damage if you play a lot of full-contact American football. Now think it about is a that. harmful game to the players. We have this argument of, oh, video games will hurt people or whatever, but America has a multi-generational game, one of the most popular games on Earth, that causes direct harm to the brains of everyone who plays it. And we're all mostly okay with this. Right. No one's being like, oh, we got... Well, some now people, they are. Some finally, people right, are finally, starting to go after football. we are football. seeing people like, no, I'm not going to let my kid play football. They will play tennis or golf. But during all those times when they were smashing pinball machines and you know playing D&D &D with Satan, football, no one thought that they were like, yes, my kids are playing football. Great, nice and wholesome. I mean, back when they were smashing pinball machines, people played hockey without helmets or masks. So... <laughs> All right, so sports injuries are real, but obviously we're packed. We're not going to talk about sports too much. We are going to talk about esports, right? So we always think, right, esports. Is I right. bought that stock image and people like it. I told you. Okay. <laughs> people have this sort of, you know, conceptual idea like, all right, yeah, if you play a lot of esports, you're going to hurt your wrist, you'll get carpal tunnel, right? You'll, you'll bust up your arm or you'll hurt your eyes, right? You're staring at a screen all day. You're going to mess up your vision. They have these ideas, but is that really true? Are you really going to mess up your eyes by staring, sitting too close to the TV or staring at it for too long? Are there really people who hurt their wrist and it gets messed up from playing? Do you know anyone who's had that problem because they played too many esports, right? Well, the answer is I did research and I said, yes, absolutely. You will mess up your hand and wrist. There was a dude, right? What's the dude's name again? Hax. He was a big time Smash Brothers player. Big time. Right? And because of the way you hold a GameCube controller when you play Smash Brothers... You don't hold you... it like a normal human being. You do something called the claw. 
right? This is not a fake thing. This is real. He played Smash Brothers so much, pro-level Smash Brothers player, totally messed up his hand and had to retire. Totally real, not a made-up story, right? Uh, luckily, your eyes won't get messed up, <laughs> right? Sitting too close to the screen, staring at the screen all day. Actually, I found a study, video games improve vision. Because you're really good at focusing on things and looking around real fast. There we go. Now, the jury is out on certain kinds of screens and very young children whose eyes are still developing. Yeah, I don't know if you want to put your kids in a VR helmet all day. That might not be the best idea. Oh, uh, that would be a good way to make a Skinner box, though. Yeah. It's sort of like it's sort of like a lot of people out there are like vaping, acting like it's not hurting them. It's like, yeah, probably not the best idea. Yeah. I guess, you know, it might be better than smoking, but... Probably don't want to be like, oh, kids, safe to vape. No, let's not do that. <laughs> let's stay away from that as much as we can. That's bad news, right? But yeah, you will. It, there are a lot of people. It's not just hacks, right? There are a lot of Korean, right, Korean StarCraft players who have just totally messed up their hands and can't reach the, the APMs that they could before and are forced to retire due to injury, just like any sort of basketball player. Luckily, it's their hand and not their brain, so you can still live the rest of your life, but your esports career could end. Yep. So they're harm of games. These games were – and it's the game's fault. Right? StarCraft could have been designed differently, but it was designed in such a way that if you want to win at that game and be the best, you have to push buttons really, really fast. And because they designed the game that way, playing it a lot will hurt you. I right? Smash wrist. Brothers was designed in such a way, not intended to be an eSport, but if you play it to be the best you can be, you have to do things with your hands that are going to cause you bodily harm. I hurt my wrist kind of badly snaking in Mario Kart. That's a good example. Mario Kart DS has a, the snaking mechanic. If you want to win in Mario Kart DS, you have Just to keep doing this. And you will hurt your hand doing that. And it's a real thing that happens. It's not some joke. Okay. <laughs> Don't think... That the tabletop world is immune from the injuries, right? So Jungle Speed, and play Jungle Speed? No? Okay, you should play Jungle Speed. It's, there's a bunch of copies in the library. Uh, the Jungle Speed that we bought in, like, the 2000s came with a rubber totem. They have finally, in the United States, for the first time I'm aware of, re-released Jungle Speed with the wooden totem. If you don't know how Jungle Speed works, in this game you flip over cards one at a time going around the table, and it's not a slow game, it's called Jungle Speed for a reason, because when <laughs> cards are matching, are revealed, players must reach out and grab the totem as fast as possible, and you can imagine trying to snatch this wooden totem while other people's hands are going at it, right, can truly result in injury. <laughs> Not a joke, totally real. That is, and by the way, we found this post, we Googled, we said, Jungle Speed Broken Finger to see if anyone else hurt themselves, because one of our friends did. Yep. And we found this post, and then we noticed after the fact that the post was by famous RPG designer Jason Morningstar. So, so Jason Morningstar, the designer of Fiasco, who might be at this PAX, broke his friend's finger playing He's not finger here. Jason says he's board not board. here. Oh, but he's he still here. broke his finger playing Jungle Speed. Then your fingers are safe. Or his, he broke another guy's finger playing Jungle Speed. <laughs> It's a real argument, right? So if you're making a tabletop dexterity game, which is, in my opinion, a sport, you need to make it in such a way, sadly, without the awesome wooden totem that will hurt people. Now think back to this moment, because right before we talked about this, we just said, oh, they brought back the more dangerous one. It's more fun. You should all play it. <laughs> <laughs> you should get the more dangerous one. All right. So... All right. So we're not going to go too much on this, because, you know, this with every single panel at every you know, PAX and other gaming event talks yeah. about. But it has to be said right. unequivocally, this was nothing more than a harassment hate movement. Uh, it was a practice run for white supremacy. This is some bullshit right, right. here. But the question you want to ask, right, because the panel is about the harm of games, right? So how much of this was the fault of games, right? The game's fault, the game developer's fault, right? For making games, for making games in a certain way, how much of this was their fault, right? So there obviously aren't pretty much any studies on this. But we did do a panel at PAX East way back. 2011? Super long time ago. And what I, what I know, it's just things that I noticed, just anecdotes, which again, the plural of them are not data. <laughs> but <laughs> what I noticed was that certain games, when you look at the design of them, and you know, it, it just seems like the one game I looked at was this uh, MOBA called Heroes of New Earth, which recently shut down permanently. And this game was designed in such a way that, like, you join a game at random, and your success and failure is highly dependent on your teammates, right? And it, the design of the game was such that it would make me really angry to play or really sad to play. If my teammates were better than me, they would really hate me because I'm dragging them down into the dirt, and now they can't win. And if I was really better than my teammates, then I was really angry that they were dragging me down. Right? So playing that game, even though it wasn't really violent, it was just like wizards casting spells, nowhere near Mortal Kombat, made me a lot more angry than playing <laughs> Mortal Kombat. 
right? And, and also you the community at, was so harassing and just vitriolic and horrible. Yep. Pro- possibly because of the way the game was designed. So. Right, and I looked at other games, you know, even other MOBAs, games in the same genre, and the communities around those games were a lot more welcoming, right? You saw a whole bunch of games in the same genre, and you could sort of see design decisions between these different games that caused more or less levels of harassment going on, right? You play Hearthstone where you can't chat with your opponent, and, you know, okay, obviously we can't tell how the community is just by looking at it because we don't see anyone chatting, but when you look at the community in its forums and its other places, it seems to be a lot better than the communities of other card games where people are allowed to chat, right, with each other. So, no studies, we can't have any conclusive statement on whether games cause people to become angry harassers, right, but... Uh, it seems that you, when you look, there is some correlation between the design of games and the behaviors of the community around those games. And I want people to look into this, which mm-hmm. is why I brought it up. But at the same time, there are other harassment brigades that happen very similarly to this in non-video game areas. Like there's a comic skate thing where they're going after people. There's an anime mm-hmm. voice actor thing going on. Mm-hmm. It's always the same type of harassment brigade that functions the same way. So it's not unique to video games. So or the best game. we can say is that this is something that is happening in media among fandoms of anything right. right now. Is there something that like the comic book writers could have done in the stories or artwork of their comic books to cause their audiences to behave differently? I don't know. But, you know, think about it. Come on. What's wrong with you? <laughs> All right, so the harms that video games cause upon the people who make them, right? Is that how much of that, right? Obviously, a large part of that is the fault of capitalism, <laughs> right? But how much of that is the fault of the game, right? Back in the day, the first games, right, arcade games, they were designed in such a way to rake in the quarters, right? And thus, people designed games such that they were the kind of game that would, people would put a lot of quarters in. Right? And that's how the developers were paid. Then we switched over to where you make a big game and you sell it for a pile of money. Right? And now, developers, this is where the crunch came from. Because in order to make more money selling games, you had to make bigger and better games that you could sell for a higher price, and you had to make lots of them. So people were, and you had to then, you had to make really fancy graphics for those games, which caused even more money and took even more people and more work and more time. It gets even more late capitalist than that. The easiest way to make money is to take something you're already making and just make it cheaper by whatever means necessary. Mm -hmm. And we see the toll in the like the work-life balance, if there is even any balance anymore, of a lot of people who make games. Some of you are nodding along in very solemn, sad agreement right now. Right. And nowadays, we've, we've reached another stage where actually, you know, by, by, by having, you know, microtransactions and DLCs and ways to just keep making more money on the same game, that actually makes developers' lives better. They make one game, and they don't have to crunch. They can just keep casually working on a game for a super long time, and that game keeps money flowing in as long as people keep playing it. The developers' lives are better, but maybe the players' lives are worse than if you just bought a game once. Or, of course, the developers could make the game fire most of the people involved in the game and have a tiny staff continuing to make the low effort monetization scheme that continues in perpetuity. Right. So there's a lot of cart and horse switching going on here, right? Between the monetization model, the design of the game, and the results of those combinations have on the lives of the people who are making the game and the lives of the people who are playing the game. Let's even get back to football. The people who play football and are suffering from these injuries, they're gamers playing a game, but they're also employees of an industry. So we can't discount the harm that may be caused to the employees of the game industry as separate from the harms caused to the players of the game industry if such harms exist. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, addiction. So this is like one of the first harms of games that people think of, right? And it's the question, of course, is video game addiction real and how much of it is the fault of the game versus how much of it is the fault of something else or even if it is real at all? Right? So I tried to research this a whole bunch, and it, there's tons and tons of material on it, obviously. And the problem is that I'm not really qualified to say anything about this. Addiction is not only really complicated, but the current state of the art in psychology and medicine is evolving rapidly. We still don't understand addiction very well, despite it being researched for a very long time. I had to read, I actually did read three different, like, complete, super long articles full of, like, uh, 
didn't understand all of them, which is why I said not qualified to say, of psychologists arguing with each other about whether video game addiction counts as addiction the same way addiction to drugs counts as addiction. I mean, there's the DSM definition of addiction, which itself keeps changing. There's a lot of different ways to define what addiction is. Usually they come around, is there some demonstrable harm to someone's life that they did not anticipate or expect or desire as a result of the activity coupled with compulsions and other things. But even that definition keeps changing. So I can't even begin to ask the question of, is it the game's fault if I can't even answer the question of does it exist? What I can tell you is that stories you may have heard about people playing games for so long that they died are absolutely true. That is a real thing that happened, right? There's an article I found, 15 people who have died playing video games. Not all of them died from being addicted to games, right? There were just, a, you know, some of those instances were other weird things that happened. But the majority of them were actually people who had just played a game for too long. They went to some, you know, PC cafe place, sat down, no one checked up on them. They were just so into the game, they kept playing it and playing it and playing it, and they didn't stop to eat, they didn't stop to rest, they didn't drink enough water, whatever it was, they had a heart attack, they collapsed, that was it, the end. It really happened. It is not a joke, right? So how much of that is the game's fault? How much of that is alcohol's fault? How much of that is anything's fault when people, what is addiction is a question that is very difficult to answer and understand. What causes addiction may be a combination of environmental factors, genetic factors, and external factors, and the confluence of all three might be what causes the harms of addiction. Mm. So if some psychologist who's not a crazy person like Jack Thompson, but is a real scientist comes out and they're like, they've learned about this more and have something to say on it, let's not dismiss them like Jack Thompson Right? We should probably listen to what they have to say because this could be a real thing that we actually have to worry about. Right? This is a real thing that we do have to worry about. So reward what this is, schedules. This is reward schedule. So to understand what's happening here, right? So this is based on like, you know, Skinner box, right? We have a little mouse and the mouse has a lever and a food comes out, right? So in the black bar, right, basically what that is, is the mouse, every time the mouse pushes the lever, a food comes out. How often does the mouse push the lever? Well, the mouse pushes it when they're hungry, basically, because they know a food is going to come out pretty much every time they pull the lever. Yep, or at least a fixed number of times. Push it 10 times, get a food. Push it 10 times, get a food. Minimum wage, pellets. Yep. The red one is push the lever, and you don't know if food will come out. It is a food slot machine. Right? And when you have the food slot machine, the mouse pushes the lever like crazy. The slope all of the that time, line, whether they're hungry or not. The slope of those lines is how often, arguably how compulsively, the mouse will keep or the rat will keep pushing the lever. Variable reward schedules do demonstrably cause a behavior to be done more often in almost all cases. This is a real thing in humans too. If I make a slot machine where you put in a dollar and a dollar comes out. You, you, you'll do it whenever you want what the thing is that's in there. That's just the laundry machine change thing where I put the dollar in and the dollar comes <laughs> that's right. If you make a slot machine like I in a casino... I play that all night before packs. If you make a real slot machine like in a Vegas casino, like these ones, people will compulsively use these. It's just, that's, that's solid psychology. Have you been to a casino, like actually gone to one like Atlantic City? Okay, good. It's not, it's not Keep those numbers people. low. Keep those numbers yeah. low. So this is actually the original idea that I wanted to do this panel about. I wanted to do a panel all about, right, the fact that gaming these days, right, seems to be going more and more in the direction of just being gambling, but not looking like this, right? This is gambling. How is this not gambling? The only difference between this and a slot machine is that when you put money in, you're guaranteed to get a minimum... I, right, sorry, you go to a real slot machine, you could get zero out. It's possible. You buy a pack of magic cards, the only difference is there's a minimum. You know you're getting at least this much. It's probably less than what does a pack of magic cards cost these days? Three dollars, four dollars, something? I don't know. I haven't bought them since I have the no 90s. idea. I, I quit know. when Fallen Empires came you out. Could get, like, you could get all worthless cards, but it's like one rare per pack no matter what, but it could be a bad one, right? They're not all great, right? So it's like there's a minimum payout. Does that make it somehow different than this? Because it has a minimum payout, but you could still lose. You could still hit the jackpot. In fact, at least with this one, at least with this casino slot machine, real money comes out. Right here, no matter what happens, real money will never come out. <laughs> right? All well, you're going to get is cardboard every time. I do have some valuable cardboard because at least I can resell that cardboard. If anyone wants I see a these, pile of Siobhan Dragons, I'm your man. I always see these stories these days of like how much the Black Lotus is worth. When I was a kid, the Black Lotus was like $300 flat. Yep. And I saw a kid who literally takes a binder full of them. 
in those days, right? Like literally pages and pages of black lotuses. And I'm pretty sure those were all sold off individually over time. And that person probably doesn't have to work. But this is gambling, right? This has been around since I was a kid in the early 90s. Kids were doing it, and no one cared that it was gambling. Baseball cards, sort of gambling-ish, not quite almost like magic cards, or magic cards are kind of worse, right? Well, magic cards also, there was the early rules talked a lot about ante as well. There were even cards in magic when it first came out about ante. You were expected to play magic and ante up cards from your own deck, and whoever won the game won those cards permanently. There were cards that would manipulate the ante. Mm -hmm. Think about that. The game all those cards were banned from all tournaments. Now, that's been pulled back quite a bit, but that was there from day one. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like I was really concerned about this thing. Like, whether, whatever you personally feel about gambling, whether it's, you know, good or bad, acceptable or not, whether it's something adults should be allowed to do, I think that most reasonable people in this country feel at least children should not be gambling. <laughs> right? But meanwhile, we have children buying Pokemon cards and no one cares. Right? No one even thinks that that's children gambling. It's children gambling. Why not just send them to Vegas? At least they can get real money. Most of the parents who think... This is better than buying Pokemon cards. <laughs> Most of the parents who are mad about Pokemon cards think it's Satan, not gambling. I know, right? Anyway, this is gambling too. And here, right, you get nothing no matter what. Even if you get all, what's, what's the highest level? Like legendary skins, I guess? I don't know. So I play Overwatch a lot. And if any of you watch me streaming Overwatch, I don't open loot boxes just because I have like 500 and people get really mad when they see that number. Like, it bothers people. He doesn't buy loot boxes, but all the free ones, he just doesn't open them. They're just sitting there. I'll hover over them sometimes like, oh, I could open one. It'd be like if I had some free magic cards that I got and I won a bunch of magic tournaments and the prizes were magic cards and I never opened those. I just kept winning tournaments with my free magic <laughs> cards that I got for free. But yeah, this is gambling, but when you do this, Right? At least if you send your kid here, they could come home with cash. If you send your kid here, unless they become, join the Overwatch League, right? you don't need skins to win the Overwatch League either. You just need skills. Right? Yeah, there's no odd job skin. You buy those 50 loot boxes. Right? <laughs> Only the old people laughed at that. <laughs> if all of those 50 loot boxes have the best possible legendary costumes and skins in them, you've still lost $40, and those $40 are never coming Because the deal is you may get joy out of those skins. But they're not transferable. I can sell my magic card. I can't do anything with this except look at it myself and make other people look at it. Right. Usually while I'm but doing meanwhile, this. Meanwhile, on Steam, you can resell your skins on Steam, but that seems even more shady. Yes. Now you actually are gambling just like Vegas. <laughs> you can, when I got a Counter-Strike skin that's worth $1,000. Sell it on Steam. Now I, have a th I can buy $1,000 worth of games. Now this gets into another issue of this is how a lot of video games are monetized. This is how gaming as an industry is growing. And it's weird because with Magic the Gathering and this, you could buy the booster packs and get the random draws, or you can just go to a store and buy individual Magic cards. Mm -hmm. In the video games here, you can't just go buy a skin. You have to use the economy of the game to get the coins to do that. There are some games that are designed where there's no loot boxes, where you just buy the things directly, yep. right? Like buying a DLC. But here's the thing. If the video game industry in particular is growing in revenues because, partly because they've been focusing on this gambling model, in addition to direct sales, that means that there are people who are buying games who would not have paid money if they had to monetize it the other way. There are people who are paying money gambling who would not otherwise have interacted with that game. So we expanded in two different monetization streams that are doing different things, and people are spending more money as a whole, and there might be ethical concerns around that. So, all right, this is gambling. <laughs> Anyone seen this in the, in the expo hall? This has been around at PAX, making me pretty mad. So the way these things work, right, is the, this, you know, if you own a store, right, you don't sell everything that you stock on your shelves, right? You, you buy a bunch of stuff to put on your shelves in your store, and you can't sell all of it because sometimes you buy a thousand Funko Pops, and they just sit on your shelf, and everyone who comes <laughs> in your store sees them there every week and doesn't buy any of them. And you say, man, I paid for these Funko Pops at wholesale prices. I got to get rid of them. I could just throw them out and put some games on my shelf that will actually sell. Or if I stuff them in a box, some rube will pay for them. Right? This isn't new. Going back to anime conventions in like the early 2000s, you'd see dealers selling these big paper bags that were like, grab bag! And if you open it, it was just the one manga no one wanted that year. I've seen people... It was like, Geo Breeders. I remember it. Right? I've seen people buy these things, look at them and say, oh, right? And then people defend this. People are like, oh, this is great. I was, I was happy with what I purchased, right? I bought this box and I'm, I'm happy with what was in there. I think it was, was a good deal, right? And it's like... You just, you're getting ripped off, right? Whether you know you're being harmed or not, 
right? There is, I don't need a study to show the financial harm. You just got ripped off. You paid more than a thing was worth and got less. You could have just bought that same junk, those Funko Pops off the shelf for what they were charging in the discount rack, and you would have paid less money for the same stuff. Right, but it's you're seeing loot boxes literally coming into the real world, and these are with being drop sold. sheets and odds sheets and all the same stuff. Right, these are being sold to children, and no one cares that it's gambling. Right, but if the same kid went to a slot machine, they would be horrified. Right, I don't need some scientific study to show the harm of this. It's just inherent. Right? Well, maybe the argument is just got to treat them both the same way. Yeah, I mean, if you look, the real casinos that have the real gambling have all these things in place, right? If you tell a casino, I'm a gambling addict, don't let me in, they are required by law to not let you in. They have signs everywhere saying, you know, if you're a gambling addict, call these numbers, right? Uh, not at, uh, not with casinos, but at your bar, if you drink too much, the bartender has to be like, sir, you've had enough. Right? There's no one at, at, at the gaming store required to tell a kid, kid, you've had enough magic cards. <laughs> right? But what's the difference? Why shouldn't there be? There needs to be. Right? Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, the question I really want to ask, right, and this is the thing that happens to me when I argue on the internet, is does fun justify harm? Right? That person who bought that booster box, they say to me, it's fun, therefore it's okay. If I go online and I say, you know, they should change it to be this way so it's not gambling with children, they say, should say, well, it's fun, so it's okay. I mean, I'll use an example. I'm an adult over the age of 21. I drink alcohol. I enjoy alcohol. I do it because I choose to. Uh, and it does harm me. I can't pretend it doesn't harm me. It harms me in a pretty small way. I choose to accept that harm. I choose not to accept more harm. I'm not going to drink more alcohol. But as an adult, shouldn't I have that choice? This is fun. I'm justifying this harm because of the fun I get from this alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were a lot of people... I, I've been having these arguments with people even back since like the World of Warcraft days where I was worried that people were near who I knew were playing it too much. We knew, there was a guy, Asheron's Call Guy. Oh, Asheron's Call Guy. So I, Asher, okay. so one, I know, do hope he's okay. So in, in college, in freshman him. year, right, one of my friends, their roommate, who I never talked to because it was Asheron's Call Guy. Uh, Asheron's Call, by the way, was a, a, an MMO owned by Microsoft. <laughs> For in, the old in the early 2000s. It's, they had made a sequel, but they're both dead. Anyway, literally, every time I went into my friend's dorm room, Asheron's Call Guy was playing Asheron's Call all the time. He played so much Asheron's Call that guess what? He did not make it through school as far as I'm aware. Like right? he'd have a plate where he had a peanut butter sandwich he's eating and he's playing the game. We'd come back later in the day and the plate is like just covered in crumbs, but it's still sitting on his lap. Right. So like eight hours later. Whether or not addiction is real, right, we already discussed that. I still saw with my eyes as someone who was 18, 19 years old, this person who looked to me like they were harming themselves or being harmed by this addictive game, right? And their justification was... It's fun. I'm 18. I can do what I want to do. It's fun, therefore it's okay. And I'm like, you're gonna be, you're gonna get kicked out of school. It's not okay, right? So does fun justify harm? How much fun justifies how much harm, right? And that's the number one defense. Anytime I bring up, you know, any kind of thing where you know these games are harming someone, it's fun, so it's okay. I mean, I just defended it. I drink some alcohol. It harms me, but I'm down with this. Right. Down with the harm, right? Well, I think we can all agree that there is some sort of order of magnitude line we can draw where the fun justifies the harm, right? I have never done heroin. Line. I will not do heroin ever. Do not do it, right? Drugs are bad. It says it on your badge. I am confident that if I take heroin, it will feel fucking amazing. That from everything I've heard, I'm confident that, that is, it will feel incredible, right? But the harm that it will cause to me, that I believe it will cause to me, that we know it will cause to me, it's not worth the fun. Right? The fun of doing this does not justify the harm. It will probably ruin my whole life because it will be so fun. Right? So at where do you draw the line? It's like how much fun per harm it makes it okay. Right? Let's get rid of the scary slide. Yeah. To do a different slide. Right? This is a much more, like, this is what we're really talking about. It's not necessarily just harm, it's risk. So like, Rim loves to go skiing, and every time he goes skiing, I say, don't die. He always sends me a, an Oregon Trail tombstone that just says, R.I.P. Rim, he skied, or R.I.P. Rim, don't ski. <laughs> I mean, there are people who are professional, like, you see other things, and it's like, you know, people hurt themselves, I don't know, ice skating. But professional ice skaters don't hurt themselves too often, right? Professional skiers hurt themselves a lot. With Lindsey Vaughn, she like broke every bone in her body or something, right? And that makes it scary because it's like if the professionals are hurting themselves that much, I'm not doing this, never, 
right? Because I'm just, I've never even, also it's cold and wet. Who wants to be cold and wet? Now I made my choice. Like I chose to ski. I accept that risk. I believe I've assumed that risk and I'm a very, very good skier. I chose to mostly give up on mountain biking because the risk was higher for the same reward. You still mountain bike occasionally. Yeah, but, but I have to ski like every week. The last time I went mountain biking, I got a bruise the size of a basketball because I flipped over and landed on a tree stump. <laughs> At least skiing, it's, it's, there's snow. I can slide on that snow as long as into I don't a tree. hit a tree. And then I'm following the snowman. I did tree. hit a tree at Killington a few weekends ago, but not too hard. Okay. <laughs> That's very assuring. What am I gonna, how am I going to get a PAX panel, which is me? Did you come to see just me? I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, how much fun, like, I can't, I can't deny, though, right, the fun of shushing down the mountain, right? That, obviously, I like a roller coaster, I like going fast, It's right? a roller coaster you control. That, I kind of, that idea, I can't deny, sounds fun and does appeal to me. But say it the same it way, is, it's a roller coaster you control. Right. For me, for me, it is not worth the potential risk. For Rim, it apparently is. That's a difference between people. But if it comes to real harms in real life, there is, there must be some sort of line we have to draw where we say, no, that's not okay. Heroin is clearly on the no side, right? Skiing, probably on the yes side, I guess, maybe sometimes. Right? <laughs> right? Well, let's back up a little bit. What about the industry? Does, if I make a game that is fun, and there's a risk of that game being harmful in an addictive way, say that game is risky for people who have addictive behaviors. How addictive am I allowed to make that game before my game is the problem? Right. Is it not that we should draw a line saying gambling or no gambling? Or we should just say maybe, you know, the reward schedule on the slot machine just needs to be less evil, right? It needs to pay out more often. It needs to be pay out more kindly, right? And then it would be okay, right? What's the, the stat on alcohol? Like 17% of people who drink alcohol are likely to become addicted to it? What if you have a game where 10% of the people who play it will get addicted like Asheron's Call Guy and ruin their lives? Are you ethically able to release that game. Right. Like, Maybe you that. just have to change your game design so it's like, okay, this game's a way less addictive, right? It's more just like, I don't know, cake and not like heroin. Right? <laughs> From okay. cake. And that's the main message we want to come through with here today, right? Is if anyone who's making games, right, try to make games that don't harm people. We're not saying make games that do good. Not everyone's going to make super better. Not everyone's going to make a game that literally makes people's lives better and changes the world. At least try to make a game that doesn't hurt that many people that much. Right. When people make games, I don't think that they're thinking about, they're just thinking, you know, we want more, more sales. We want people to play the game longer. We want people to have more fun. Well, more fun could mean more addiction, depending on how you're measuring the fun. If you're measuring the fun based on hours played, number of people buying it, how good your reviews are, right? Are you, right? You're measuring fun that is at the expense of harm and you're not counting the harm in your evaluation of your game. Well, like, think about that. You make a game and your goal is we want people to play the game more because then they're having fun. If they, if the game is that red line, that variable reward schedule, if I end up designing a game based on playtesting that is hyper addictive, is that any different than if I designed the game to be hyper addictive on purpose for evil reasons versus if I just made a game that I see people playing a lot? Right. And not just the gambling, right? The other potential harms and perhaps unforeseen future harms. Try not to make a game that makes people hurt their arm while they play it, right? Don't make people push buttons too fast or hold the controller in a weird way, right? Make the game comfortable for people to play, right? Make it maybe so that, you know, you don't have to push it super fast, right? So old men like me can play with our slow hands. <laughs> yeah, I'm the not... problem is being in your 30s doesn't count as a sports injury. Right? <laughs> I can't do DDR that fast anymore. Right? You know, and there's other ways, you know, that I, I didn't even want to bring up, I almost brought up, I don't know if anyone saw this story, people made some like uh, games that got banned from Steam because they had some really horrific imagery and stories and themes. Don't look them up, they're really horrible. Right? Don't make those. Those are mm. bad. Alright? Are we done? I think we're done. I think we're about done. Right, I good. hope this was in interesting and enjoyable and a little bit of real talk. Mm -hmm. And I hope that all of you go away from this. Just be introspective. When you play a game, think about what it's doing to you and make sure you understand what it's doing and are okay with that. Right. When That's you're having step. fun, think, okay, this is really fun. I love this. Is this hurting me? Is there some other game that's maybe just as fun that won't hurt me as much, right? Bring that how much I'm hurting myself, how much money I'm spending, how much money I'm losing into your equation when you're evaluating how fun a game is. Right. And more to importantly, if something how you want to spend your time. Even if the answer is yes, like yes, I'm having fun. Yes, I accept this harm. Yes, everything's fine. If all your friends are saying no, try to reevaluate a little bit. Right. And maybe you decided this game is as harmful as alcohol, which I will drink anyway. Moderate. Right. 
don't spend the $10,000 in the loot boxes, but maybe $10 in the loot box and then you stop? Hey, right, whatever. They, the game developer deserves $10, right? It's not a problem. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Go enjoy packs. Enjoy Play. the rest of your packs. Play good game.